executive education unit at APU is very pleased to host today's talk, which will be given by Professor Catherine Elgin, Professor of Education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Catherine is a philosopher who has to her credit several articles in contemporary mainstream epistemology. The questions she has worked on through much of her career uh, have relevance to issues in education. For example, uh, Catherine has argued that the central issue that epistemologists ought to concern themselves with is understanding rather than knowledge. Today she will speak on art and education, a topic that a lot of us at APU are deeply invested in. Uh, so without further ado, I give you Catherine Elgin. Thank you much for inviting me. I'm obviously very interested in issues about art and education. Um, a major problem that we face, in the US anyway, and I assume elsewhere in the world, is, is that the arts are not taken very seriously in the field of education. Um, in the US, every time there's a budget cut, people decide the thing to do is cut the art departments because they think art is a frill. It's something that might be nice if we have plenty of time and plenty of money, but we've got to be on the important things about education. And art isn't that. Now, I think this is a very bad mistake. Uh, I think it's a mistake for multiple reasons. One is, first of all, I think the arts are very important for their own sake and give value to human lives. Another is that I think that the cognitive uh, accomplishments fostered by understanding in the arts are very useful uh, across the curriculum. So we don't have to just go to art for art's sake to make sense of uh, the value of the arts, although I want to say a lot in favor of art for art's sake too. So what I want to do today is discuss some of the reasons why I think the arts are very important to uh, education, and then we can see, um, A, whether I make a plausible case, and B, whether even if I do, it's the kind of case that might be something to be considered if an educational establishment is very much invested in the sciences. And I'm gonna argue yes. So why should the arts play a central role in education? Well, as I said, one of the reasons I think so is because I think arts are intrinsically valuable. They're valuable for their own sake. And you might ask, well, why should we think a thing like this? And there are at least a few reasons. One is that art is ubiquitous. Every culture throughout history has had art. The earliest known paintings and drawings are over 14,000 years old. The earliest known musical instrument is over 23,000 years old. Back in the cave, when things were really tough, people were still engaging with art. It's got an impressive pedigree. Moreover, encounters with the arts, whether as a producer or as an audience, enrich experience. They provide texture and nuance. They extend our experiential range, and they advance and deepen our understanding. So our epistemic resources for approaching reality are deepened and extended through encounters with art. They expose us to factors we might otherwise be blind to, and they sensitize us to their significance. Jane Austen wrote a letter to her niece, who was also attempting to be a novelist, in which she said, three or four families in a country village is the very thing to work on. And the reason is this. If you think about Jane Austen's novels, you can see this. She thought three or four families gave both enough complexity and enough simplicity that certain features of the human experience could be made manifest there where they might be swamped if you had to take into account you know, the, the full 
range of factors impinging on a person living in Delhi, say. There's just too much stuff coming in. How are you going to make sense of it? Well, let's bracket a lot of it and then see what we can see. That's what Austin was saying. And she's saying we can see a lot. And I'm going to actually say that this is effectively a thought experiment. Works of art enable us to distinguish between signal and noise. They can factor out certain things and say, concentrate on this and this alone. Then what will you see? Whereas, as I said in reality, there's always a lot of other stuff going on that might confuse you. And they also enable us to recognize that what might seem to be the signal in one case is just the noise in another. And this is a very important thing. Um, if you think about, I mean, my, my artistic example of this is Cezanne, where rather than using, say, um, colors and shapes as vehicles for depicting scenes, he used depiction of scenes as a way of heightening our understanding of the role of color and shape. He just flipped it. Well, what else is the importance of this? Think about other cases. Think about ordinary cases in education, I'd want to even say, where this goes on. Where sometimes if you're trying to teach a skill, you have, it's got to have some content. So, for example, um, my favorite example, because it's so obviously dumb, is um, in the U.S., it's very common for students in about fifth grade to have to memorize the capitals of all the states. This is completely useless information. Nobody needs to know it, and if they did need to know the capital of Idaho, they could just go look it up. So why is it that you know, millions of kids in the US are sitting there memorizing the capitals of states? Well, it's not because we care about the capitals of states. It's because we care about developing the skill of memorizing a list of unrelated items. This is as good a list as any. So what the poor students think is the content of what they're supposed to be learning isn't really it. What's really important is the skill here. And this happens, as I said, I think quite a bit in uh, education. And the sense that we can flip signal and noise, that we can say, this is just a vehicle. This is just something on the side. Whereas over there in the next class, it's where the action is. That's something we want students to be sensitized to. And I think the arts are a very good way of doing this. The arts enable us to discern patterns and regularities that might be obscured in daily life, that might be overridden but by more conspicuous but perhaps uh, less significant factors. So a subtle thread running through experience may be completely overlooked until you see it in a work of art, and then you say, that's what was going on. That's the way it is. A, a fair example of this, I think, um, is the sort of thing that might happen, say, when you think about This is an example that you can find in Hume. Um, he says, he talks about what he calls the, um, the mild passions, which are emotional states that are so mild and so ordinary that you might overlook them. One of his examples is uh, the enduring affection for an old friend. It doesn't have a distinctive feel. It's not like being angry or something like that. But it's a base characteristic that orients you to the world in a certain way, wanting the good for your friend, mourning when bad things happen to your friend. And that there even is such an emotion may be something that we're sensitized to through works of art. Since it's not something like, um, I don't know, as I said, you know, rage or happiness or something like that, where it's, it's got a distinctive phenomenological feel. So the suggestion that we, we learn certain patterns in ex of our own experiences through the arts, I think, is something to be taken seriously. 
Another important thing I think uh, that we learned through the arts, we can see by looking at Kant's discussion of the arts, very commonly people talking about art say that um, you know, there's no accounting for matters of taste, it's all subjective anyway, which might make it seem that there's no point in art education. If it's subjective, what are you gonna be doing? But Kant says this won't work because he says it's not like um, something like, you know, butterscotch ice cream tastes good. Once I've said that, there's no follow-up. You say, I don't like it. Um, where do we go from there? There's no place to go. But with a work of art, Kant says, you can provide reasons. You're making a general claim. This work is intriguing or derivative or original or beautiful or uh, depressing or whatever. And you're open to challenge. Why do you say a thing like that? Give me some reasons. And the fact is, when we're discussing works of art, we can give reasons. If you see a movie, you're really gonna like this. Nah, I wouldn't like that. Yes, you will, here's why. And um, this is actually very important, I think, uh, for more than just an understanding of art, although I think it's very important for understanding art. Um, it has to do with uh, important features of reason giving. When we give reasons for our interpretation or evaluation of a work of art, they're genuine reasons in the sense that they're supposed to be considerations that we take it ought to bear on what our interlocutors think. So I think so, you should think so too, and here's why. But I also know that these reasons are apt not to be decisive. That is to say, you may have reasons for thinking otherwise. So we can actually, first of all, we can actually just have an argument about a work of art, um, either about how good something is or even about what's going on. So for example, um, you talk, we're talking about King Lear. Was King Lear mad in the mad scene? Or was he angry? Was he furious? Was he insane? We could argue about this, and you can bring up your reasons, I can bring up my reasons, you can point to this feature, I can point to that feature. Let's assume, as is not unlikely, that we're never gonna come to a completely compelling answer. You know, okay, you win, I was wrong about that. These debates don't usually end that way. But what do they get? They get parties on each side to appreciate more about the work and about what's going on in the work than they saw at the first place. I just thought he was insane. You point out these other features that maybe call the insanity verdict into question and they've got something going for it. So I now have a more textured understanding A of the play and B about whatever relation there might be to ordinary fury and insanity. So, by sensitizing us to the insights that can be gained through uh, what I want, want to call something like a deep ambiguity of the sort that we sometimes find in works of art, we gain something of general significance. I can see other things more richly now that I'm sensitized to the fact that there isn't just one clear, obvious answer to this story. Moreover, I think works of art serve as what I call laboratories of the mind, um, places where you can test things out. And in thinking about this, um, I want to start by talking a little bit about ordinary experiments, the kind you do in science labs. Only instead of talking about a heavy duty science experiment, I'll talk about maybe something that you might want to do in high school. Um, you want to know whether water conducts electricity. Well, here's what you wouldn't do. Turn on the tap, get a vat of water, and see if you can establish a current. Go out, get some rainwater, see if you could establish a current. Go to the local river, dig up some water, and see if you could establish a current. Why? Because all of these cases, the water you're dealing with has impurities. If you found a current in that water, you still wouldn't know whether water, that is to say H2O, conducts electricity, because it might be that the impurities are doing all the work. So what do you do? Well, you get 
some distilled water. And you work with that. And you see if you can establish a current in that. And it turns out that you can, but it's a very small current. So you amplify it. You put it to an amplifier to get something that you can readily detect. Which is to say, you took something that is not to be found in nature, subjected it to forces that are not to be found in nature, in order to find out something about nature. There's no distilled water just out there in the world. This amplification was due to all of these gadgets that you and your friends built. And that's how you found out the way the world is. So if that's so, then saying, well, the fiction isn't true, well, the fiction distances us from reality, that's, that's correct. But so did the experiment. And it was because the experiment distanced us from reality that we could find out something about reality from the experiment. And this is very important, because when we start thinking about it, we see that in the sciences, many of the very same devices that are used in the arts are prominent. So in addition to experiments being, to some extent, fictional, we could go further. Think about thought experiments. Those are fictional on the face of it. Imagine what somebody riding on a light wave would see, Einstein says. OK, here's what would happen if you were riding on a light wave. Number one, you couldn't, because the light wave is too small. Number two, it's going so fast, you would get crushed. Number three, if you happen to manage not to get crushed somehow, you wouldn't see anything because a photon would be so big compared to your size that it would knock your head off. Nevertheless, Einstein says, forget about all that stuff and ask what you would see if you were riding on a light wave. What does this require? Willing suspension of disbelief. Remember that from literature classes? You have to learn what aspects of the situation you're supposed to suspend belief in and what you're supposed to suspend disbelief in. Pretend that these factors didn't matter. Recognize that those factors still would matter. Then what would you see? That's how thought experiments function. They're little works of art. And of course, they can be challenged if you said you suspended the wrong judgments. Um, works of art also foster creation and innovation. They're novel, or they can be. They can bring out new ideas. They, they can relax or break conventions that are normally in place and see what would happen without them. What if? And then you write your story or compose your sonata or whatever and see what would happen. You establish new conventions, things that simply don't obtain in general, but if that were a rule, then what would we see? And again, we may be in a position to see more about reality. Works of art often use metaphors. Why? Well, okay, here's an important thing about metaphors. Um, maybe I guess this was something people learned in elementary school. Metaphors are supposed to be creative ways of saying something, which has the suggestion that you could say the same thing literally, but your prose would just be boring. So put a metaphor in. Well, it turns out that's false. Um, I mean, as probably every one of you who's ever tried has recognized, metaphors defy literal para paraphrase. You can't say just what the metaphor means by giving a literal gloss on it. And this, it turns out, is not an accident. Uh, because here's what uh, psychologists have discovered about the role of metaphor. If you think about language, what we have, OK, before we think about language, let's think about set theory for a minute. If you remember from set theory, sets are very open in their membership requirements. Assuming you avoid the set theoretical paradoxes, which is kind of easy to do, any collection of objects constitutes a set. So there's a set containing the Eiffel Tower and my cat and the number three. It's a perfectly legitimate set. It's a dumb set. Nobody wants a label for that set. 
because we're never going to talk about it again if we're lucky. But there are other sets that are valuable. We want to talk about them again. There's the set of chairs, the set of green things, the set of trees, the set of photons, a set of um, postmodern novels. All of these have something significant in common, which is why we've come up with labels for them. Once we've got the label, we can use it literally. But there are all of those other sets, and sometimes something that has no literal label is worth marking out. You could coin a new term, but then you have to teach it to everybody. Or you could use a metaphor, and a metaphor is a device for opportunistically marking out an extension that has no literal label. So it's a device for making up for the gaps that literal language leaves. This means it's an extraordinarily powerful tool that we have. And it's powerful, I'm going to say, not just in the arts, but if you think about it, even in the sciences. Um, my favorite example is the science of immunology, because that's a science that actually is grounded in metaphors. Uh, the immune system um, is the system that defends against disease. What are disease organisms? They're little invaders that the immune system recognizes and combats. It remembers them, which is why you have an immunity to the disease you had last year. It, if you have an autoimmune disease, it's because your immune system is making a mistake. It's an error. It falsely thinks that in attacking your spleen, it's really attacking a foreign invader. The entire science is grounded in militaristic and epistemological metaphors that they then explore how to spell out in literal terms, in terms of you know, biochemistry. But, but basically, it starts with a metaphor of your immune system as your defender against diseases. So if you said, well, metaphors are just frills, it would be actually quite amazing that a science like immunology even exists. Because if you were just kind of playing with language, getting something that can actually give you vaccines and so forth would be rather a miracle. But if the language is orienting you to its subject matter in a way that no literal language does, and that orientation is powerful and effective, then it's not a miracle that progress is being made in this area. So the suggestion then is that devices like metaphors that are very useful in the arts and maybe are first and best learned through encounters with the arts turn out to be very, very important in science as well. Uh, we could go through a whole bunch of sciences where basically what, first there were metaphors and then things got literalized as the metaphors became entrenched. Um, think about field theory and physics. You don't, you know, fields of grain or whatever. Well, it's sort of like that, but there's no grain and, you know, there's no actual space, but other than that, it's pretty much the same thing. Okay, got that? Um, actually, the answer is if you did physics, you have got that. But um, it, it seems like a rather uh, amazing thing until you think about it, whereupon you say, no, actually, that makes a good deal of sense. There's another thing that um, the arts can do for us that's very important. Um, and this is something that David Lewis mentioned. He says that works of fiction in particular, but I think this could be generalized to other works of art as well, enable us to frame hypotheses that we might never have otherwise thought to frame, but we have plenty of evidence for. So as soon as we frame the hypothesis, we see that yes, that's obviously so, but we needed the work of art to give us that. Um, Lewis uses works of fiction as examples. Um, I want to use a, a work in the visual arts because it's, it's just kind of intriguing. Um, think about Jackson Pollock paintings where he took paint and just splashed it, it on a canvas like, you know, threw paint on a canvas like that. These paintings, you cannot forge a known Pollock 
because you could never get the exact same gesture out there to get the exact configuration of blobs of paint. You can forge unknown Pollocks by doing that in your backyard too if you want, but a known painting you, uh, by Pollock you can't forge because the gesture that made it is irreplicable. Okay, that's kind of an interesting thing about Pollocks. But then you start thinking about it, and you think about, well, yeah, but in general, gestures are irreplicable. So there's something more general going on here about the uniqueness of every single act. It can't be done exactly that way ever again, and therefore, it's likely that its effects can never be fully reproduced by another act. So you start thinking about the uniqueness of actions once you think about what's being exemplified in the Pollock. First you think about it maybe with regard to art. Maybe you say, well, you know, similarly you could never get exact, exactly the configuration of paint in the Mona Lisa or whatever. Then you say, yeah, but what's so big deal about paint? You could never get exactly this gesture elsewhere. And so you start thinking in a different way about uniqueness of individual actions in consequence of just thinking about what's going on with this painting by Pollock. One thing that Goodman has mentioned that he, I actually have worked on, he just kind of dropped it out there, um, is that in the arts, emotions function cognitively. And basically, the idea is this. It's very common um, when we talk about our experiences with art. This is not true of every art or every work of art, but it is fairly common that our emotions are activated. Um, so, you know, horror movies make you afraid. Um, you know, the, the painting was very moving. The um, concert was very dull, uh, whatever. Um, and sometimes people think that the fundamental thing that the arts do is activate emotions. Goodman's view that I agree with and that I've um, done more to work on is to say that this is not the stopping point. Rather, when you have an emotional reaction to a work of art, that affords you information. So if you reflect on your own reaction, you can see more about the world by seeing that this information is encoded in your reaction. Um, give you a couple of reasons for thinking this is at least mildly plausible. One is um, something that um, the women in the audience may know something about. If you ever attend a woman's self-defense class, one of the things they will tell you is if you're in a situation where you're feeling nervous or vulnerable, take your reaction seriously and get out of there. Now, question, why? Answer, because your emotions are picking up on something in the environment that you can't yet crystallize, but you're picking up on it. And so you're sensitized to danger. So even if you can't quite figure out why this doesn't quite seem right, take yourself seriously. And this is the reason I, I, I bring, actually I bring this up for one reason because it's, it's kind of a good example, but a second reason is um, if you think about how the emotions evolved, you understand why this should be so. Imagine, you know, here you are, um, some animal, um, and you're prey to some predator. I don't know, let, let's make it, you know, hominids and we're prey to tigers. So here are two possibilities. One is you develop an emotional reaction. In the neighborhood. And you get out of there. The other is you wait to see whether it really is one of that kind that, you know, goes around eating people and is actually quite hungry now. Whereupon you 
are not going to survive to reproduce. Therefore, your gene line is gone. And, you know, developing a distant early warning system that says, you know, if it strikes you as scary, take it seriously, is the sort of thing that would uh, foster reproductive success by living long enough. Um, so, so the suggestion is that, you know, that there's a good um, biological reason for thinking that emotions can afford information about the environment, that they, in effect, are quick and dirty heuristics. They're not always right. There's no claim that they're always right. But there is a claim that there's, there's enough going for them evolutionarily to think that they ought to be taken seriously. And then there's the fact that they can be educated. You can refine your emotions in response to experience, so you can become a better detector of things. Um, my favorite example of this is if you're from Australia, uh, your response to every snake is fear, because every snake in Australia is poisonous. Come to the United States, and there are a lot of perfectly nice, benign snakes around. So you learn to fine tune your reactions, to tell the difference between the garter snakes that just eat bugs or something, and the snakes you ought to be afraid of. So rather than the undifferentiated snake fear you had as an Australian, you now have a more differentiated one because you learn factors of the environment that make some difference. Um, or if you're, I don't know, from you know, somewhere out in the bush and you come to Bangalore, you've got to fine tune your fear reactions to deal with the traffic. Um, you know, <laughs> you know you, you, it, it's just scary. Uh, and you're, you're going to fine tune your fear reaction because you, you now have a new set of dangers that you have to confront. We can learn this. Moreover, I'm suggesting we can learn it through the arts, and sometimes that's very valuable for a couple of reasons. One is, um, think about negative emotions. Um, terror, grief, horror, and so forth. First of all, you don't want to have them. Even I, I just gave you this big riff on how they're informative. Nevertheless, you'd rather do what Well, number one, if we're talking about stark terror, you're not apt to learn much because in a really terrifying situation, thinking about your reaction to your reaction and exactly how and where and to what extent it's justified is not in the cards. It's fight or flight time, and that's what you're going to be concentrating on. But if you go to a horror movie where you have these reactions, as it were, offline, you can attend to your own responses. You can modulate your own responses. If it's a very good horror movie, you can learn to distinguish among very subtle differences in fear that you're capable of by just noticing how scary is this? Exactly how scary is that? And so you'll learn more first about your own reactions and secondly, you'll be in a better position to attune your reactions to the environment. So the suggestion that the arts can, through their evoking and exciting emotions, can serve as sources of insight, I think that's very plausible. Um, notice, by the way, I, I, you know, I've, I've just been talking about the ordinary cases here, too. But we can move this again over to the sciences, if you want, and think about your response as a scientist to a surprising reaction. Eh, wrong again. Or, this is very curious. I wonder what's going on. If your curiosity is excited, then you're attuning yourself not just to the fact of another failed experiment, of which there are plenty, but to there being something interesting and potentially intriguing in this. And that's something you want to know about. Now, there are other cases we might want to consider, too. 
Um, at, but, but rather than going into that, we might want to ask about this. Why should we worry about the arts in particular? I mean, if we leave aside the intrinsically valuable bit, um, I've talked about a bunch of things that the arts do that are also found in the sciences or elsewhere. And so you might say, look, you're going to get that anyway. You're going to get it in your science class. You're going to get it in your politics class. You're going to get it just walking down the street. Why do we need to study the arts? And I think the answer is that the arts are particularly good at it. That is to say, they, um, they do a bunch of things quite well, um, partly because there are more degrees of freedom. They can violate more conventions than are readily violated elsewhere. Um, they're also dense and replete. That is to say, they can um, symbolize along multiple dimensions at once. And this is actually quite important in sensitizing us to certain sorts of things. Um, for example, um, okay, uh, a, couple, a couple of examples. Um, one might be, think about um, popular love songs. Question, why are so many love songs sad? I mean, this is actually a very intriguing question when you think that love is a good thing. You might therefore think that love songs should be happy. But although they may be talking about your current happiness or whatever, or may have a happy motif in some way, they're also often very sad. So what's going on with that? And the fact that they can be both about a happy topic and themselves sad may be, and, and, and this is going on simultaneously, it's not like paragraph one, paragraph two or something, this may be telling us something about our attitudes towards love. What is it, that love doesn't last, that love doesn't um, provide as much as we hoped? Um, it's not clear what it means, but I think that the question, why are love songs sad, is something that deserves a lot more investigation than it's gotten lately. Um, another question that you might ask is about, um, say, emotions that might seem antithetical. Um, which we find in works of art not all that infrequently. Love and hate. Standardly, you might think you can love, you can hate, you can flip back and forth rather frequently. But is it possible to both love and hate the same person at the same time? A priori, you might answer no. Various works of art, like, for example, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, make it manifest that the answer is yes that you can both love and hate the same person at the same time, so you get a new configuration that you hadn't thought was possible. Um, works of art exemplify, that is, they show things rather than merely just saying them. And this, I think, is, is a very powerful thing. This is one reason why often people say that experience is narrative, which I don't know that I think that's exactly right. But the idea that we, we like examples. If, if you have a theory and I say, give me an example of that, and you can't, it's problematic. If you, you, know, if you want, um, in student papers, you're apt to say, be sure to provide examples. Well, why? Um, on the one hand, um, there's a reason for thinking it's probably not very important, which is that in statistics, a single case counts for nothing. So if you can provide me with only a single case, that's pretty much the same as nothing. But if you can't even provide me with a single case, that seems manifestly worse. So it seems as though statistics doesn't have the whole story here because the zero one distinction here is mattering. Why? Because this, the case shows something. Another thing works of art do is convey complex chains of reference. Um, so, for example, um, point, uh, I don't know, say a portrait of Gandhi. Um, it denotes Gandhi. That's its immediate and direct reference. But it also alludes to Gandhian ideals. So it sensitizes you, the audience, to certain ideas that were exemplified in Gandhi's life. That 
are not literally depicted, maybe can't be literally depicted, but can, through a chain of reference, come before your mind and be taken very seriously. Now, these features are shared by other symbols, scientific symbols, mathematical symbols, political symbols. If you think about, for example, what goes on in a political poster or in a political speech, you'll see that it's symbolically very complex. And what's literally going on is usually a very small part of the story. Tone, choice of words, emphasis. Is there irony there? Those things are going to be playing a major role. Also, what's omitted? What wasn't said? What's going on with that? These are the sorts of things that studying the arts will sensitize you to and enable you to understand the political symbols better than if you just say, well, you know, there's Obama talking about his tax code again. Um, you know, well, why is he talking about this? Why is he mentioning that? Why isn't he mentioning this other thing? Um, was that an allusion to Ronald Reagan? Was that an allusion to Lincoln? Um, th there he goes again, might be all that you, the political theorist, can say if you haven't noticed the ways these symbols have functioned. So you might wonder, well, couldn't we just teach our students these things in other areas, the scientific use of metaphors in science, the scientific use of fictions in science, the use of irony in political speech by looking at political speeches and so forth and so on. And the answer is to some extent, of course, we could. Uh, I, I think that the arts are particularly suited to it because they can isolate in ways that others can't, but it could be done elsewhere. But there's one point that I want to raise now that I think is really worth taking seriously because there's something where I think maybe the arts are preeminent and that's perspective taking. Uh, begin with babies. Uh, babies suffer from what philosophers call the egocentric predicament. They think the world revolves around them. Um, and, and, and apparently this is literally true. Uh, they're, they're kind of like Barclay and idealists in that they um, think things exist only when perceived. So this explains interesting facts, like you know, we play peekaboo with a little baby, the kid finds it scary. Why is it scary? Because he thinks you don't exist when he can't see you. Out of sight is out of existence. And that means that things, you know, I mean, and, and he's got plenty of evidence for this, you know, what, the only evidence he's got of what there is is what he sees or hears. So they don't know that there's more to things than meets the eye. And um, they think, you know, when mama disappears, she ceases to exist, and then she pops into existence again. So luckily, little kids turn out to be pretty good empiricists, and they early on come to recognize that the best way to explain the order and regularity in their experience is to hypothesize continued existence. The reason why mama looks the same time, uh, the way she looked five minutes ago is because she's been existing the whole time since and hasn't changed her appearance all that much. Um, so this explains how they'll get object constancy and eventually other sorts of things like the causal order of reality just by using these empiricist techniques of what might be called inference to the best explanation. Little kids are very good at this. But what, notice what this doesn't give them. It doesn't give them any reason to think that there exists any point of view other than their own. Things are the way they appear to me. They continue to be that way whether they're appearing to me or not. But appearing to me remains the anchor how do you get out of that? I suggest that a very large part of the answer may come from storytelling. And in particular, from telling stories where the child adopts the point of view of the protagonist. So you have Winnie the Pooh goes bump, bump, bump downstairs. He didn't know that this was the only way to go downstairs. In fact, he thought there might be a better way but this is the way it always happened. Suddenly you're in Winnie the Pooh's mind thinking that there might be a better way than being dragged down the stairs by your foot and bumping your head on every step. 
the picture and the story give you access to another mind. And then you get to think about, well, how would things look from there? If you were Winnie the Pooh, wouldn't you kind of wish he'd pick you up and not keep bumping your head or whatever? And we move on from there. They learn the characters have points of view. And they then speculate that people have points of view, too. And they learn how to take the points of view of others. Moreover, they learn even more. Um, once you've adopted a point of view, you, re you can reason from that point of view. Well, it seems to him that so-and-so, even though in reality such and such, or even though it seems to her that such and such. These are the sorts of things you can pick up from learning the stories. So we, we might recognize that, you know, not just merely that the boy is afraid of the tiger, but we also come to appreciate how it uh, feels to be afraid of the tiger because you're in the character's head being afraid of the tiger. And then you learn the world, the tiger's actually pretty scared too because you're in the tiger's head. So we learn that there's more to things than meets any particular eye. We learn that different people have different perspectives. And we come to realize eventually as we, keep, as we grow up, I mean, I'm, I'm not all saying this happens with Winnie the Pooh going bump, bump, bump downstairs, but um, you learn how deep and complex people's orientations to reality can be. There's always more to understand. There's more to his point of view, something we've overlooked. It only appears in chapter 14, but it was there from the beginning now looking back on it. Whereupon you start looking at people differently as having a depth and complexity to their own points of view that is in principle endless. There's always more to the way things appear. And we can extend the range of points of view we examine. So instead of assuming people are pretty much the same as me, except some of them confront tigers and others don't, if I extend my epistemic reach through works of art, I can find out that no, samurai warriors were not all that much like me. However, from the samurai perspective, such and such seems so. There's an honor code that strikes me as perfectly loony, but on the other hand, if you were operating within that code, I can see how this would seem like a reasonable thing to do. And I think, as I said, that basically we get this either from literature or other narrative arts. Also, I would say, I mean, obviously, you know, any kind of dramatic art, any cinematography would do the same thing. Um, narrative dances do the same thing. But we learn this from our youth, and it's something where I think the arts are, if not mandatory, at least very, very close. It's not something you could easily get from a disinterested, distanced, social scientific point of view or anything like that. Getting inside somebody's head is the sort of thing that the arts enable us to do. And I think it's absolutely critical for living a human life. Um, I, I think it, it's just mandatory. It starts, as Plato said, I mean, Plato was very hung up on this. We have to start with the fables that the mothers tell their children. It doesn't start with when you start taking literary criticism in college or something like that. It starts at the very early stories. Uh, the, initially, it's narrative, but I would also want to go on and suggest that it's not just narrative, because there may be other modes of art that do this, and other aspects even of the narrative modes. So take a couple of examples from different points on the continuum. Um, children's story, Good Night Moon, it's a great uh, little kid's book, and it, it's about going to sleep at night. If you turn page after page, as the child is getting ready to go to sleep, it gets darker and darker and darker. So initially, it's bright colors. 
and then there's less light and less light and less light till on the last page it's gone and the the you know the just the the vibrancy of the colors is doing a lot of work in that story it's uh, you, you'd read it to somebody who's maybe two years old um, Another uh, example from another end of the spectrum might be Titian's uh, paintings of the Pope. They're portraits of the Pope, and the Pope's wearing all of these popely um, accoutrements, very, um, you know, jewels and furs and velvet and all of that stuff. And he's looking completely corrupt and decadent. It's not, you know, Pope as leader of the church, Pope as this creep who is ripping us off. Um, and if you look at the portrait and you, you look at exactly how the various accoutrements of elegance and wealth are functioning, you, you realize what a negative picture this is. It's conveying something vivid. I'll give you one Last example, because it's, it's kind of different, but um, also worthwhile. Um, think about monuments, um, which are basically public art. Uh, one, um, I, I'm just going to quickly compare two monuments. One is the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., where it lists on the memorial all of the people who died in the Vietnam War, all, the, all of the Americans who died in the Vietnam War, those you know, 58,000 something or other names. There's a lot more symbolism to it, but the part I want to point out here is just a little bit of it. One is the names are given in the order in which the people died, and they're given without any recognition of rank. Compare this with a memorial uh, in Canterbury Cathedral in England to people who died uh, in the, um, what was it, the Crimean War. This one has in big, bold letters the name of the captain of the regiment. In smaller letters, the names of the lieutenants. Then there are two examples of this. One then lists in little tiny letters the names of all the privates who died. The other example doesn't even bother to list the privates. It just says, and 243 privates. What the Vietnam Memorial exemplifies is a, a commitment to a kind of equality. They're all equally worthy of being commemorated. What the Canterbury Memorials do is exemplify, guess what? The class structure em exists even after you're dead. Uh, and um, and it, I mean, it's different ways of memorializing the dead. And if you look at just you know, the printing on these monuments, you can be attentive to this. And that's the kind of thing that study of the arts would sensitize you to. What's going on with this? What's going on with the fact that in the Vietnam Memorial, they didn't list rank. This is not just leaving something out like middle initials. It's leaving something out that is significant. So the question that I think the arts would enable you to attend to is what kind of commentary is being made by these two and how might that commentary reflect on the understanding of history of those who made those monuments? which, of course, is the sort of thing that people in history worry about. But it's through being able to interpret the work of art that they have a topic for concern here. And I think this is really going to be very critical to ask how, how the in interpretation of works of art um, enables us to understand a vast number of other things and therefore, why it's worthwhile thinking that rather than the study of art taking away from the study of other topics that you might consider more important, even if you do consider it more important, the question would be how does the study of the arts advance 
your education in those fields you think of is quite important. Thank you. Thanks for the talk, but I had a couple of questions. Like when you said, when you compared it with science, you said in arts we can cross on the boundaries. Mm -hmm. Boundaries where we can explore and show more innovation in our responses. But in science also we come up with responses to already explain phenomena, already plausible explanations, and come up with more plausible. Like it's not that we stop it, but we still create room there to improve. Only it's that it doesn't happen that frequently as it happens in arts. Maybe the rules are not as strict as in science, in arts, but they do also. They're also, we, we also criticize also. We all, all also downplay a lot of ideas that these are not, you recognize them, but you don't encourage such kind of ideas in arts also. But oh, don't absolutely. I think, I mean, I think this is entirely right. I think it's a difference in degree. And um, it's, I mean, I, mean, I mean, I would even strengthen your point a bit more. Um, because if you think about what happens when, um, let's, let's say in a failed experiment, you were very confident that the experiment would show thus and so and it just doesn't. That's when you have to get creative. That's when you have to open your mind to possibilities that you thought were off the table. So think about, for example, the Michelson-Morley experiment that's supposed to exemplify the, um, just measure ether drift, and they couldn't get a result. First thing, okay, the machine isn't sensitive enough. Michelson actually kept refining his interfer interferometer um, until 1936 because he could not believe that there was no ether. So he, he kept thinking there was something wrong with the experiment. And what happens is when something fails, you have to open yourself up to new possibilities. And as, let's say, the easy possibilities don't work either, you have to get more and more and more creative to the point where eventually you get to conceptual revolutions like the theory of relativity, which is a very major creative advance um, that happens simply because ex you know, business as usual couldn't accommodate the phenomena. So it's certainly the case, I think, that in, in both science and math you have a great deal of creativity. And um, this is, I mean, this is actually one of the reasons why I think there, there are huge cross connections across these fields. Because it seems to me that um, we have differences maybe in degree, but not differences in kind. Um, it's certainly the case that even the um, entrenched conventions are viable in the sciences if it turns out that going along with them just simply can't make sense of things. So, so I, that's entirely right. And the question like what you said, we can borrow a lot of innovation, a lot of uh, new ideas from arts in science. If we have understanding of arts, if we do arts also. But what about the reverse process? May, if I understood you correctly, what about the reverse process? If I'm doing arts, what can I borrow from science? The method of inquiry is completely positivistic. I look at objective objectivity aspect of the science, okay, but then... It, okay, um, I actually think you can borrow a lot. Um, and I think if you were an artist, you would be borrowing a lot. Um, maybe not um, <laughs> putting all the footnotes in. Um, but a lot of creative work in art involves experimentation. What if I did this? Now, to experiment, it's not just sort of doing something or other. It's saying, if I hold these other factors fixed and I make this one change, how will that change the effect? And um, I think that's something that artists do all the time. Because if you change too many things at once, you don't know what you're doing. Um, another thing that I think is a common 
in both the arts and the sciences. I mentioned uh, the use of exemplification, the idea that, you, that we make examples and work with examples of things. Um, here's something, okay. Um, there's this group in New York called the Judson Dance Theater that does postmodern dance and um, basically they make dances out of ordinary daily motions and activities. So you'll go to a performance and you'll see people doing things like rock, walking across a room, running across a room, carrying a mattress, climbing over some barrier or some, but it's all very ordinary. And um, this is actually quite mystifying because you can't figure out where's the dance in it, why am I here? Why did I buy a ticket? I mean, you know, if you, to see people walking around New York is not hard. So, um, but, but the idea is that the, in the dance context, these ordinary behaviors exemplify some of their salient properties or make properties salient that they otherwise wouldn't be, wouldn't be salient. And so they sensitize to in much the way I think that happens in science. This is a process that Sally Baines calls um, defamiliarization, which is taking something ordinary and making it unfamiliar so you attend to it. Likewise, if somebody's trying to experiment on an ordinary, um, you know, um, any ordinary thing, you know, ordinary features of water or ordinary features of corn or something. The ordinariness makes you overlook stuff. So you have to defamiliarize it. And I think that the, the sort of way that the scientists do that is somehow mimicked in the artistic cases. So I would say that there's really a lot of um, bi-directionality here. Thank you. Um, yes, it, this is some uh, a bit about um, the figure and ground that you mm -hmm. mentioned, this uh, signal and noise uh, yeah. uh, contrast, or that, yeah. that art flips it, or allows you to flip it. I was reminded of a um, lovely little couplet in uh, Wallace Stevens' poem, 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird, mm -hmm. in which one of the couplets goes, uh, I do not know which to prefer, the beauty of inflection or that of innuendo the blackbird whistling, or just after. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the silence that That's follows. That's perfect, yes. <laughs> yeah, and, and the, I mean, and the thing about flipping signal and ground, I think, I mean, that's actually something that we find in science, too. So think about what goes on um, in a whole bunch of psychology experiments. Um, you, the subjects, are asked some questions, and you answer them. And you, the subjects, naturally think it, that the content of your answer is central. But actually, what the psychologist is measuring is your reaction time. Doesn't matter what you say, it's how long it takes you to say it, because that's gonna tell you something about um, reasoning processes. You know, you, know, you know, was it second nature, or did you have to reason through it? And so, it's, it's really quite fascinating to realize that the question you're answering, you know, you know, you say George, you say Harry, the psychologist doesn't care. It's just how long did it take you to say it? And that, that again is simply a, a, you know, a, a flipping of um, a signal and ground. Be and it's an interesting one, it's a powerful one because it, it, it yields psychological insights, but distanced from the content of what's being said. Now you have a question? Why do we have to compare it 
with another subject like sciences to bring a case for us. Number one, or do we have to try and understand why is that the society is currently probably abandoning art? Like, Good. if it seems so. Okay, um, let's start with the second question. Um, for, I, I mean, I don't know that we absolutely have to do any comparison. Um, and partly for exactly the reason that you mentioned, that um, there are aesthetic elements in all subjects. So, for example, um, if you talk about um, the beauty of a mathematical proof, um, there's, there's a question about why we care about the beauty of a mathematical proof, and there are mathematically worthwhile answers to that, but the sense that actually already the mathematicians in their professional lives are saying, that's an ugly proof, I don't like it. Um, that's a very important point. And similarly, you know, I mean, we'd say the same going all the way across all of the disciplines. We could say the same going across other aspects of human life entirely. So I think that the, um, I think that the, uh, the uh, part of the question about why we have to ask this question may just be a political question. That simply the way things have worked out now in many countries is there's so much emphasis on the idea that the overarching goal of education should be something like training people for the workforce or something, uh, which I think is a really dumb idea. I'll just go with that. But, um, but, but it's a very common idea. And you'll see in, in all of these policy debates, the, the emphasis is on how this curricular change or how this I uh, educational innovation would foster creativity and 21st century skills, which are supposed to be skills for you know, advancing technology and stuff like that. It's against that background that people are asking so what's so good about art? Um, although I've got to say it's not only, I mean, this, although this is a 21st century version of it, it's a very old argument. Um, in a, um, a, a, a debate that occurred in uh, 1903 in the US about the um, curriculum in the traditionally black colleges, Booker T. Washington said art should have no place. It's only when we become successful and rich and prosperous that there's any time to worry about art. This was 1903, I mean it was, uh, I mean it's, I, I'm, I'm just telling you it's pedigree. Um, I mean, but it's, you know, it's a, a long time ago, um, but, um, but you know, the very same argument was going on there. We've got to be successful and then we can worry about art. How are we going to ensure success? Well, let's study technology, let's study job training, let's study STEM stuff. Um, and I think it's against that background that I'm trying to suggest that even if you take that seriously, you have a reason to value the study of art. It's not that I think you should take it seriously, I think people should just stop taking it so seriously, but even if they do, that is not a reason for marginalizing the arts. Um, now about the first question, the one about is art for art's sake, um, the same as um, understanding uh, human beings, I don't think so, because I don't think all art figures in that. I think there's very good art that doesn't. Um, so if you looked at some, some very abstract art, um, something like, um, I don't know, serial music or something, uh, or um, something like Mondrian's or whatever. I don't know that I, I would say, I, I think it's very good art, and I think it's very much worth taking seriously, but I don't think that anything that clearly involves understanding human beings stems directly from that. So, so I wanna say I think that um, a big piece of it is what you're saying, 
but I, I would want to recognize also that there are, there are other things that would qualify as um, great art that, that don't. Um, so I'm going to step aside from the question of, um, or rather the issue of you know, what art is good for, why we should be educated in the arts and so forth. So when you were detailing the kinds of understanding that um, engagement with the arts fosters, um, I didn't quite hear you talking about understanding uh, the art object itself in terms of its form or grammar or whatever. Um, and it kind of, I think, um, intersects somewhere with your question. Um, so as Kant would have it, I guess, uh, engaging with the art in a sort of, at a sort of second order, right, or, or a second order engagement with the art sort of uh, fosters some kind of self-understanding in an attenuated sense because you sort of revel in the uh, scope of uh, your own understanding or whatever. If you were to be a realist about uh, status of the aesthetic object, you'd say something else. Is there some, is there something you'd, uh, is there a position that you have on this business? Um, yeah, and I think it's none of the above. Um, the, my suggestion is this, that uh, the object itself is something that does have a grammar and a form. It's a symbol, and to engage with it is to engage with it as having a specific symbolic structure. Uh, you want to interpret that structure and make sense of it. Um, when I said that I thought, um, I mean, two of the things that I said that I think bear on this, one is about the idea that, that works of art are dense and replete. So since they're dense, but by that, this is Goodman's term, it's what he actually takes from math. Um, it's not dense in the sense of obscure or something. It's dense in the sense that between any two points, there's a third. So, the, you know, the, like the, the number line is dense. Which means that if, some, if a work of art is dense, then it's going to be enormously difficult to determine exactly what symbol it is. It just as it's enormously difficult to say exactly what point at the number line you're pointing to. You can get in the neighborhood, but you could get ever more precise, ever more detailed. If it's replete, it symbolizes along multiple dimensions. So there's always more to things than meets the eye. Question, why is it worth going back and looking at a work of art that you've seen many times before? Answer, because there's potentially more to be seen. You may see more in it, given you're giving it a new look. And both of these require attention to the object itself. It's not something that you can just sort of prescind from the object and say, here's the, here's the message you get from the Mona Lisa. I already read that. I don't have to go look at the painting because there's more to it than that. There's something more that might be seen. There's something more that might be understood. And density and repleteness of the symbol itself, of the, of the work qua symbol. There's also another element which goes into this, um, which is there's also going to be a question, what exactly is the work qua symbol? Which of its elements symbolize at all? And that itself is something that may be up for grabs and reconsidered under new um, headings. Um, if you think, for example, about um, feminist readings of literature, one of the things that they've made very significant is the idea that you have to pay attention to omissions. Uh, and so, you know, don't just look at what's there, what's left out, and what can we see by what's left out there? And so all of you people who've just been reading these things for what's there and ignored what was being omitted have to go back and say, oi, there were all these omissions too, now what do I make of it? And I think that's, 
That's the reason why the attention to the very object is absolutely mandatory and we can't get away from it. I don't think it's exactly a realist position because it's not the object qua object, it's the object qua symbol. And then there's the question about, yes, and what symbol is that? So you're gonna get this sort of endless, endlessly iterative way of thinking about things, which may be compatible with realism, but wouldn't have to require it. That may make it intentional with an S. It doesn't necessarily make it intentional with a T because it could be that something that was not intended to refer it nonetheless does refer. Anybody? <laughs> 